Hey Uproar, welcome to the Uproar Live YouTube page. Now you're already here, so if you haven't already, be sure to click the subscribe button that you see on your screen. This way you will not miss any encouragement that we send out all throughout the week. Now, if you're ready, because I know I am, you are ready to experience a word that is bound to speak to your heart. Something that you feel as though God himself spoke to you, let me tell you. It is going to be so great that we don't want you or anyone you know to miss out. So be sure to share this with a friend, a coworker, a family member, or anyone else you know. And if you would like to give and connect with the ministry, you can do so now using one of the various methods that you see on your screen. Now I hope you're ready because we definitely are. Let's get to this word. Being a pastor through the years, I've, I've gotten to the point where whenever something is brought to me, whether it's counseling somebody, whether it's uh, some bad news or something that somebody said, you name it, I, I'm, I, I've learned to, to not get so caught up in what's being presented that I'm not looking for the source of where it came from. The source. Because if you entertain the symptom and do not get to the source, it'll, it'll keep coming back. And so when I'm counseling people, I'm trying to listen to where is this coming from? Where is this attitude coming from? Where is this rebellion coming from? Where is this pain coming from? Where is this aggression coming from? I want to know where it's coming from. And sometimes it takes a while to figure that out because the pain can go all the way back to somebody's childhood. But it's like that story with the axe head when the servant said uh, to Elijah, he said, I, I, I lost the axe head. I lost my edge is what he was saying. And Elijah said, take me back to the place you lost it. You cannot get your edge back in life until you go back to the place where everything went wrong. Till you go back to the place where everything happened. Until you get to the source. The source. Sometimes when people bring me gossip, I, I want to know right away who's the source. And the problem with a lot of people is they don't like to drop the source. But any good journalist learns that. Facts mean nothing if the source cannot be validated. So when you find out where the source is or, or what the source is, you are able to, to deal with the problem. God is a source checker too. Remember when the father came to Jesus and said, my son has this demon and uh, he's had this for years and it tears him up and makes him foam and throws him on the ground. And, and Jesus didn't entertain the symptoms, but he looked at the father and said, how long has this been happening? Really, at what point did he start doing this? Because he wasn't always like this. It's kind of like your husband. He wasn't always like this, was he? I hope not if, that, if you married him. I hope he wasn't always, if he's in a bad place, he wasn't always like this, was he? She wasn't always like this, was she? The job wasn't always like this, was it? Worship wasn't always like this, was it? How long is what Jesus asked the Father? When, when God was stepping through the cool of the garden with Adam and Eve, he asked Adam a question, where are you? Where art thou? And when God asks a question, it's not because God doesn't know. You cannot be all-knowing, all-sufficient, all omnipresent, and have questions. So if God does not ask questions for himself, he must be asking questions for our benefit. And could it be that you cannot get right with God until you look at your life and understand and come to a conclusion of where have you ended up? 
where are you? Because you haven't always been in this type of place. You haven't always been this depressed. You haven't always been this anxious. You haven't always been this nervous. You haven't always been this shaky. You haven't always been this broken. Adam, where art thou? When you look at your life right now, are you in the garden that God planned for you? Or are you in a place that life has placed you? Where are you? Where are you? For those of you 30 plus, would your 18-year-old version be ashamed of the man or woman you've become? Where are you? The person with dreams, ambitions, getting out of high school, getting out of college, have you lived up to what that girl or that boy expected of you? Because nothing can change until you answer the question, where are you? Because until you hate your situation enough, it can never change. And sadly, what we do is we get into dysfunction, and since we can't change it, we make dysfunction functional. So where are you? Well, I hid myself. I put the fig leaves on. We've been talking about this on Wednesday night. I put the fig leaves on, and, and you know, I hid myself because I was naked. God doesn't say anything about the nakedness. What does God say? Necessarily. He doesn't talk about Adam's foolishness. He says, who told you you were naked? I didn't tell you that. You were made in my image. I am a naked God. And I am unashamed of everything about myself. You were made in my image, Adam. Every time I look at you, I'm supposed to be looking in a mirror, Adam. You're, 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 you're covering yourself up, Adam, and I can't recognize you because I'm a God that never covers myself up. Who told you you were naked? Adam, why do you have these fig branches and fig leaves covering yourself? Fig leaves covering yourself. Branches, leaves disconnected from a vine. Could it be that Adam was covering himself in leaves that were disconnected from the vine? Because understand, the minute the leaves disconnect themselves from the vine, they are dying. And could it be that the dying man has clothed himself in dying leaves? The man who is disconnected from God is clothing himself in disconnection. But God says, who told you? What's the source of this, Adam? What's the source of you looking stupid? What's the source of you looking ridiculous? What's the source of you, Adam? Not looking like me. Who told you that you were naked? Most, if we're honest, can trace back to when our lives went wrong. And it's usually tied to someone that told us something negative about ourselves. You're just like your father. That's what they told me. You're just like your mother. They say these things. You're, you'll always be stupid. You're too white. You're too dark. You're too light. You're too skinny. You're too fat. When are you going to be married? When am I going to have grandchildren? All of these questions when you're in a bad place can send you into a spiral and hate the person that God created. So who told you that you were not enough? Paul would ask this question to the church of Galatia. He says, who hindered you 
You used to run so well for God. Who, who, who? Because whenever you see people stepping away from God, they are actually recreating the Garden of Eden all over. They just don't realize it. And what does Paul says? He says, who? What is the source of you slowing down for God? It's always tied to somebody who's not right with God. Who told you you were naked? Elijah was hiding in a cave, and God had to come to him and says, Elijah, what are you doing here? I'm not going to get into the whole threat of Jezebel and all that kind of stuff, but what are you doing in this cave? This dude had four more miracles in him, and he's hiding in a cave wanting to commit suicide. What are you doing here? Can you look at your life and see that you are putting yourselves in situations that are making you into a caveman? A cavewoman? You've got so much in you, but it's going to die of suicide. Because like Elijah, you are stuck in a cave over a threat that is never going to happen. What are you doing here? Oh, I can take a little further. Cain, why is your countenance fallen? Why, 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 why? It never used to be that way. What happened in your life that has taken away your happiness? And God does want us to be happy, the Bible says. Jesus said when he was serving the disciples and washing their feet, do these things and you will be happy. But the word happy comes from the word happenings. I talked about this a few weeks ago, which means that you cannot be happy unless something right is happening. And Jesus was telling the disciples, if you do things the way I'm teaching you, I'll make things happen in your life. And the result of that will be what? You being happy. God gets to the source. And like Cain and like so many others in the Bible that I just got done naming, Whenever something happens that gets you out of the will of God, it tends to put you in a place where you get angry. That's what happened with Cain. He got angry. Being out of God's will made him angry. And the source of his life falling apart was not the bad offering he gave God. The source of his life falling apart was anger. Anger. Anger is a scary word. It's often taken lightly, but it's one letter shy of being danger. And whenever anger runs wild in your life, it becomes dangerous for your life. It will take away your peace. Anger will destroy your family. Anger will push away opportunities. Anger will deteriorate your health. It's been proven that angry people get sick quicker. And when angry people get sick, because they're so angry, the sickness spreads faster. Anger messes with your mind. Anger is a killer when it comes to marriage. It is a killer of intimacy. You cannot be intimate with somebody you're angry at. A lot of the root causes to what has gone wrong in our lives is anger. Another word for anger is unforgiveness. When you hold on to something, unforgiveness and anger walk together. Because you cannot have unforgiveness without being angry at the person that trespassed or hurt you. So what anger does is it, it creeps in. 
Extroverts tend to communicate their anger. Introverts tend to drown in their anger. Extroverts will tell you how they feel and hold nothing back and make you feel this big. Introverts tend to fight quietly. They'll withhold things from you. They'll get silent on you. They'll start to act like you don't exist. They're both anger. They're just anger shown in different ways. And I have a feeling today that there are people in here that if you could be honest, you are angry. You're angry at family. You may be angry at your spouse. You may be angry at your children. You may be angry at yourself. And, and if you can be honest, and I can be honest, there's been seasons in my life that I have felt this way. You could, you could, you could be angry with God. How have I been so faithful and you're still not working for me the way I thought you would? How can I be so faithful and so sick? How can I be so faithful and yet so single? How can I be faithful and my marriage is falling apart? And if we could be honest and just kind of lay out on the counseling table today or sit on the counseling couch. I think there's a good bit of the room if you could really be honest. You're a little angry with God. We may not say it and we may not be bold enough, but we show that we're angry with God when we don't do the things of God. We show that we're kind of angry with God when we don't give to God, when we don't serve God. It, we're, we're, we're not acting out necessarily with our mouths, but through our actions, we're showing God, God, I'm, I'm kind of angry with you. I'm, I'm doing to you what a spouse does to the spouse they're angry at when they're frustrated with them. I'm just cutting away my intimacy with you more and more and more. Because if I could be honest, God, I'm kind of angry with you. And the longer it sits, the more destructive it becomes. The longer it sits, Cain will tell you, it will push you to, to murder. The, the longer it sits, jo Jacob's sons will tell you, it will push you towards betraying your own brother. The, the longer it sits, it will have you throwing javelins at your natural kids and spiritual kids like King Saul. The longer it sits, Absalom would tell you, it'll have you assassinating your brother and taking away the best years of your father's life. When it sits... It gets destructive. And all you are is one trigger away from burning everything down. What is a trigger? A trigger is something that pops up that takes you back to the moment. It may seem so stupid but it happens out of nowhere and it takes you back to eight years old. It may seem so stupid, but it, it happens at a restaurant and it takes you back to your divorce. It, it may seem so stupid, but it's just playing around and it takes you back to your teenage years. And the reason people act out when they're triggered, and I learned this in a book I read this week, the reason people act out when they're triggered is because they feel at this moment, I have the power to do what I wish I would have did back then. So I can say something now because you're not three feet taller than me and stronger than me. 
I can say something and do something right now because I am a stronger woman. You, I won't let nobody talk to me like that. That last thing that didn't kill me made me stronger. I won't let you punk me like that no more because I've grown a little bit. I got muscles. I remember one time as a teenager, my whole life, my, my, my father always abused me. My father was an alcoholic and a drug addict. I would watch him literally beat my mother down, pull hair out of her head. I, I, I saw horrific things in my childhood. And I always said, man, one day I'm going to give it to him. One day I'm going to give it to him. Now, truth be told, I'm much stronger and taller than my father. There's still a part of me that's a little scared of my father. But that's why I started boxing at a young age, because I was training not to become the number one middleweight in Maryland, D.C., and Virginia, which I would become. I was training to eventually beat my father up. And I'll never forget, I was 16 years old, and he threw a glass at my mother's face. And I stood up to him, and I put him down. And sadly... It didn't feel like I thought it would feel. It left me more confused. It left me more hurt. I really thought that when that day came, I would be vindicated of my whole childhood. And now at 40, I still feel like trash for it. Yes, I took up for my mother, but 911 could have did the same thing. It was my anger and what I thought would be a validating or vindicating moment for my childhood is still a scar that I carry to this day. But it was a trigger. And triggers always lead to regrets. So I've learned that sometimes I got to talk to myself. Even at this point in my life, I got to talk to myself, and I don't know if anybody else has to do this, but I have to talk to the old me and say, I'm not giving you power over this opportunity. I got to talk to the old me and say, I'm not going to let you destroy what I've been building. I got to talk to the old me and say, you're better than that these days. You're stronger than that. I got to talk to the old me and say, you don't have no room in this opportunity. You don't have no room in this relationship. I, I will not let you step up in my finest hour and for somebody that's what God is saying. You got to pull down deep and don't let that part of you continue to sabotage everything that God is doing, everything that God has planned, everything that you've cried for, everything that you've fasted for, everything that you've given for. Because truth be told, the closer you get to your purpose, the angrier the enemy is going to try to make you. Look at Moses. Moses had all this unresolved anger. And it went back to his childhood. You'd be angry too if the best part of your years as a child, you were hidden in a dark cupboard. They say the first few years of a child's life are important. But I do believe that even if the first few years of your life were garbage, God can still make a great leader out of you. He did it with Moses. Moses' first few years, he was raised in the darkness. And as a baby, he would be sent up the river, surrounded by alligators and snakes on the Nile. Raised in a place that he never could quite fit in by Egyptians, raised by the people who hated him and his people. And at 40, he would see an opportunity to stand up for his Hebrew people when a Jew was striking a Hebrew or an Egyptian was striking a Hebrew and he would kill the man and, and bury him. His, his anger just took a hold of him not realizing that that's not how God wanted him to be the deliverer. And at 40, he would be a man on the run 
because he got angry. And then at 80, God would come back to him and say, Moses, I'm going to use you to set my people free. I'm going to use you to go before Pharaoh. And Moses would go before Pharaoh with signs and wonders, splitting the Red Sea, taking the Hebrew people through the Red Sea as a type of baptism in towards their promise. And the people would make his life hell. They would complain over and over and over. And one time God would tell Moses when they wanted water, he would say, strike the rock. And they will get the water they need. And Moses struck the rock. And this was actually symbolic to Jesus being struck on the cross by the Father and providing water to us. Remember the woman at the well? Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Moses striking the rock was symbolic to the Father striking Christ. But then later on, the people would start complaining again. And God would say, Moses, you know that thing we did before? We're going to do something similar to that. But in this season, they're getting closer to the promise. I want them to understand how the power, I want them to understand how the promise and the power of the word go hand in hand. So we're not going to do this striking thing anymore. I want you to speak to it. I want you to speak to the rock. Speak to the rock for the people. And Moses said, I got it, Lord. And he walked down, and instead of speaking to the rock, he talked to the people. He said, oh, ye rebels. Whoa. When they challenged him, it triggered something in him that was unresolved. God did not tell him to speak to the people. He told him to speak to the rock. Moses struck the rock and yelled at the people. And could it be that the reason God is not moving is you are so angry that you keep talking to him and not the rock? You keep yelling at her and not the rock. And God did not tell you to yell at her or yell at him. God said, pray for them and talk to me. I heard it said like this. You got too much mouth in the game. You're talking to the wrong people. You're talking to the coworkers. You're talking to your boss. You're talking to your kids. You're talking to your spouse. And God is saying the reason nothing is changing is because you're spending too much time talking to people and you're not talking to me. And out of anger, Moses struck the rock, not once, but twice. Because he was angry. Look at how his anger is making him the rock, the Bible says, that was following them was God. Look at how in his anger, he's yelling at the people and abusing God. And God would punish him for this. The punishment was so severe that God said, Moses, I'll let you see the promised land, but you're too angry to, let me step, to allow me to let you step into it because you cannot get a promise and be an angry Christian. You'll make God look bad. How can God use you when you're so angry? You're angry at home. You're angry with your family. You're angry in the car by yourself. And what happened was one little trigger caused almost 100 plus years of trauma that was not dealt with to rise up at the wrong moment. Anger always rises up at the wrong moment. I wonder how many people have allowed anger to kill opportunities. There, there's a reason the Bible says don't let the sun go down 
upon your wrath. Be ye angry and sin not. You get 24 hours to deal with your anger. If it's not over with in 24 hours, it's going to flare up and kill something. People around me will tell you, if I'm, angry, if I'm losing sleep over something, you're losing sleep over it. Because I'm not going to bed with it. I'm going to get it off my chest before I go to sleep. That, that's with every person in my life. If I have something on my mind, I'm going to text you. You're going to know where I stand and how I feel. Why? Because if I go to bed with this, I'm sinning. What are you going to bed with? How many days have you been going to bed with it? How many years have you been going to bed with it? Because when it flares up, which it's going to, it's going to flare up and eventually cost you a promise. This is what happened in our text with Haman. Haman was number two to the most powerful man at that time in the world, King Arazerses. Haman had presence when he walked in the room. His name literally means solitary, magnificent, or illustrious. Everything about Haman said, I'm somebody. He had presence. When he walked through the streets, everybody bowed to Haman. You don't get that without having presence in your life. Presence is, to me, is more valuable than any amount of money or any possession. Because when you have presence, they feel it when you go in for a job interview. When you have presence, your family feels it when you come in the house. When you have presence, the church feels it when you step into the lobby. We used to have this saying, real recognizes real. And one of the things I always look for in a person, especially if they tell me they love the Lord, is can I feel presence with you? At, at the end of the day, what is presence to me? It's, it's a relationship with God, and there's a lot of ways to define it. But it's when a person walks in the room, to me as a Christian, when a person walks in the room and you can tell that they are not alone, but God is with them. Watch how you treat me, because God is with me. Watch how you talk to me, because God is with me. Watch how you represent me because God is. I don't have to tell you God is with me. You can just tell there's something different about me. And it's not that I have confidence in myself. It's just that I have confidence in my security guard that's next to me. Amen. Haman had it going. He had the position. He, he had the prestige, prestige. He had everything that was needed to be a somebody. But he had this thing that went deep. Th this thing that had been sitting in him for his whole life and actually predated him hundreds of years. It was this thing that the Hebrew people did to his people. He, he never had the same experience, but it was something that happened that happened to his people that still made him hate a whole group of people, the Hebrews. 
God told King Saul to kill all the Amalekites, but he let the king of Agag go. And Haman is in Agag. He still feels the need to vindicate all of the people that King Saul massacred. In the eyes of Haman, King Saul was Hitler. Yes. <laughs> when you look at history, history has a way of making everybody the villain. In the eyes of Haman, the Jewish King Saul was a Hitler to his people. Wow. And he felt the need to vindicate. He felt the need to bring validation to the Agite people. And so he got in power. And up until chapter 3 of Esther, he's been doing a good job faking it. He's been doing a good job holding it together and, and holding it down and kind of tiptoeing until one day he's in a place of power and everybody is bowing Jews and Persians, and everybody in the village is bowing. But there's one Jewish guy named Mordecai of the tribe of Benjamin, by the way, same tribe as King Saul. And this triggers him. He can't think clearly no more. He's been triggered. He's forgotten about his opportunity because he's been triggered. He's forgotten about his calling because he's been triggered. He has forgotten about his wife and his kids who are also in the Bible because he's been triggered. When you get triggered, what do you forget about? He has been triggered. And this does not go back 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. This is unresolved conflict that has lasted for almost 400 years. One of the greatest leaders in my lifetime, and I caught his life on the back end I mean, the real back end. I watch YouTube videos and stuff but to, to, to hear some of his speeches now, but I missed him in his prime. I, I watched the movie, but one of the greatest leaders of this generation, one of the greatest leaders of the last hundred years was Nelson Mandela. And one of the greatest things that he did in his presidency was apologized to the people of South Africa for the sins of the nation. When he made that statement, healing was able to start. But healing cannot start until the issue is addressed. And the longer it sits, the uglier it gets when it flares up. This has been sitting for 400 years. And Haman sees a chance to be the revolutionary of his generation. To stand up to the Jewish people. I've got power and I am my people of Agai. I am their dream in the making. I am going to show them that they should not have messed with my tribe. Look at how anger has caused him to just completely black out. And God saw this coming. 
Fair or not, <laughs> God's not always fair. I can promise you that. If you're looking for a fair God, you need to find another religion. It's been said favor is not. Yeah. God's not fair. But he is just. He's very just. It's reaping and sowing. He's very just. The reason Haman's family experienced God's wrath is because they tried to hurt Moses. They were one of the reasons Moses struck that rock twice. And God didn't forget about that. But he has been holding on to this thing. And all Mordecai did was set it off. The devil is going to set you off. That's why you got to deal with it. That's why you can't let it become a danger. You got to deal with it. See, the thing about anger is anger is one of the few emotions that when it flares up, it controls your mind. The legal system realizes this. Why do you think they judge a person different upon circumstances? A husband walks in, finds his wife cheating, takes care of business with everybody in the house. He'll get a lesser sentence than the husband who spent three weeks planning. Because you had three weeks to come down and deal with it. But in the moment, even the legal system realizes that when anger flares up, it's hard to control. And if you don't deal with your anger, it's going to keep flaring up on the precipice of your promise. Moses will tell you, on the precipice of your promised land, that's when the devil is going to make that trigger happen. And Haman's trigger happened. He couldn't shake it. The hook was in his mouth. It was so heavy that he was trying to blow up a whole group of people because he was angry. And he started plotting. He started planning. He had gallows built for Mordecai, 50 feet high. I want the gallows to be so high that everybody sees him when I deal with him. Anger has a way of liking to be public. I want everybody to see how angry I am. And you know what the tragedy of the text was? That the very thing anger drove him to build was the very thing that he was hung by. I don't like, I don't know if you like it, I don't like it. I will go into attack mode if you even try. But I don't like when people's hands get near my throat. I don't like it. You know, I, you know, I, I, I black out. Because when you get close to my throat, I feel out of control. It's where I'm sensitive. It's where I'm, I'm vulnerable. A little cut in my throat can take my whole life. It's so much. It holds my head up. You get my throat, you can take me down. And when a person gets your throat, and they choke you, what they are doing is they are taking away your ability to breathe in a fresh breath. Because that's how we're built. Breathe, release. Take in, let out. Take in, let out. That's how our lives are supposed to be. Take in God's blessings, let out. 
When you take away my ability to breathe, you are taking away my ability to breathe in my possibilities of tomorrow. And what hanging does is it kills your ability to breathe. And the reason I'm painting this picture like this is because when you allow anger to consume your life, at some point, you are going to die from not being able to breathe. Because no promises are coming. <gasps> promises, possibilities, <gasps> promises, breaths. Eventually, they all die with an angry person. So do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. Be ye angry and sin not. Now, there are some great things that anger can be used for. It can be used for fuel. When I fight the devil, I don't fight him from a Ned Flanders place. You know? When I fight the devil, I pull in from a deep place. When I fight the devil, I go all the way back, depending on the size of the battle. I go all the way back from my childhood. I go all the way back to my teenage years. I go all the way back to the street corners. I go all the way back to the courtrooms. I go all the way back to the breakups. I go all the way back to the divorce. I go all the way back to starting a church at a store for no. When I have to fight, I got to pull from a deep place. I got to pull from a broken place. I got to pull from a vulnerable place and when I pull from that place the devil doesn't want no parts of me when I pull from that place demons I promise you will run when I pull from that place things start to shift and situations start to turn see sometimes when you're in a fight you gotta pull way back Jesus, when he was angry, flipped tables. It was a good anger. Whenever the Lord wanted Samson to do something amazing, you know what God did to Samson? He made him angry. And when Samson got angry, he did more for the kingdom angry than he did happy. Anger can be used in some good ways if, if you pull from it. But most of the time, we allow it to run wild and get destructive and kill our lives and kill our dreams. When God is saying, I wish you would just give it over to me. God can't even stay angry for long. He says, my anger endures for a moment. Now, one day to God is 24 or a thousand years to us. So hopefully that's not how God sits like, well, I got another 999 years to sit on this. But God said, my anger endures but for a moment. The Bible says that God is slow to anger. Because you cannot tell me to let go of my anger, but yet you stay angry with me all the time because of my mistakes. And side note, to somebody who's been thinking you're in a bad place with God, God is not angry with you. God is not angry about what went wrong. He may not like it, but truthfully, I've learned that God is seldom angry with me. He is usually just sad with me. He feels my infirmities. He is touched by how I feel. But his anger with me only endures for a moment. He gets over it. That's why he tells me to get over it. How long are you going to let the devil make you think that God's not over what you did? Adam, where are you? Who told you you are naked? Where are you? And who told you? that you were not okay with me. There's another scripture where God asks a question that I really love, and I'm getting ready to bring this home. But it was with Ezekiel, 
when he was in a valley full of bones. And isn't that what anger does? It kills everything around us. I said earlier, it kills dreams, it kills peace, it kills family, it kills opportunities, it kills intimacy, it kills, 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 kills. Ezekiel is in a place full of soldiers that have been killed. And God asks one question in the midst of death. Can these bones live? And Ezekiel does the coldest thing. He asks God a question back. Only you know. What you think, God? I'm putting the ball back in your court. And God said to Ezekiel, okay, prophesy to the bones. I want you to begin to preach to the dead things. I want you to preach to the things in your past that anger has killed. If you have faith enough to preach it, I am God enough to bring it back. No matter how you killed it, if you have faith enough to speak life, if you have faith enough to speak purpose, Maybe it's with those kids that hate you. Maybe it's with that relationship that you've hurt or destroyed. Maybe it's with that opportunity. If you have the faith to start speaking life, God says, I have the power to start shaking things up. But if you are content on sitting in this dead place, this is going to be what your normal always looks like. Not because God didn't want to change it, but because you got functional with dysfunction. And Haman shows us that if you don't just drop the source... If you don't get to the cause of why things went the way things went, if you don't drop the source like a rapper dropping a mic, <laughs> this thing is going to destroy you. Your anger has you yelling at people you shouldn't even be talking to when you should be talking to God. Casting your cares upon God says, me, for I care. How long are you going to keep yelling at the issues instead of taking them to the one who has the power to change it? How long are you going to allow this anger to destroy you? Because anger always leaves regrets. I told you, man, I was training like Rocky for years. And I was running through boxers in the gym, out of the gym, knocking people out. I was in the worst neighborhood or the worst neighborhood with the best gym in the city in Gilmore Homes. That's where I trained, doing my boxing. I was running through fighters in the ring, running through fighters at the fights. Because every time I fought somebody... I saw my father. And when the day came that I finally could prove my point to him, you hit my mother. I could have called 911. I could have taken him to the ground and not put my hands on him. I thought I would be a man. I remember it as clear as day. I threw a soda at his face and started punching him. And to this day, I feel like trash for it. To this day, I can't help but think that maybe I pushed him into a worse place. Because anger released always leads to regrets. And I could tell you that if you could do what you've been wanting to do to that person and got this, it will not make you feel better. You've got to drop the anger because you don't understand. It is affecting everything tied to you. It is a cancer that spreads. And it's going to keep passing down like it did to Haman, generation 
to generation. If mom and dad don't deal with it, you're going to have angry kids. And they're only going to get angrier and angrier and angrier. Because nobody had the courage or the fight to drop the source and say, today it ends with me. How do we deal with anger? Well, Proverbs 22 says this. It says, do not even associate or have friendships with an angry man. Or with a furious man, thou shalt not go, lest you learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. What it means is, if you hang out with angry people, you will become angry. So if I hang out with you and I become angry, that means for two to walk together, they got to agree. That means if I start hanging around positive people, I will become positive. That's what church is created for. It's supposed to be a, a community of people that can rub off on you. Because who you hang out with, you are going to become. Who are you hanging out with? True story, before I bring people into my life, it's a sick game. I need therapy still. I go to therapy we haven't gotten to these things yet. <laughs> but whenever people are close to me, at least for the first year, I go above and beyond to try to make them angry. I want to see what does angry look like to you? Because I don't want to give you my heart and then find out that I've gotten close to somebody who's corrupting me. So I just want to, you know, just pick with you a little bit. I want to see you out of form, out of fashion. I want to see how you can handle being angry and what you do when it flares up. Especially if you're considering marrying somebody. I mean, really piss them off. <laughs> Get them so ticked off. Because you don't want to find out what they look like triggered after you say, I do. <laughs> Who are you rolling with? Because I've learned the best way to overcome anger is to get around people that can control it. So what is anger doing to you? And are you willing to drop it? Or have you fallen in love with it? Because you cannot get into your promise, Moses, until you release it. And as I'm done, God's anger endures for a moment. Even with Moses, it took him some time. Moses, you know, was taken up from, from, from Mount Nebo and never came down again. It took them some time. In Revelations, they say Moses and Esau, they believe, are going to be the two prophets that come down because they've never died. Some 2,000, 3,000 years later, Jesus will be on a mountain called Transfiguration. And he'll ask for two people to join him, Elijah and Moses. And it took Moses a little bit of time. But the Mount of Transfiguration is in the promised land. But God told Moses he would never enter the promised land. And look at how a little bit of time caused God to give back to Moses what he told Moses he would never have. And if we can get this anger under control, you don't have to end like Haman. You can step into the promise like Moses eventually did. 
but it's up to you to drop it. 